continue to knit us together, prepare us, and uh, bring us forward. So, all right, you ready to jump into the Word? Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. So you have a Bible. Go ahead and open up. Guess where? Proverbs, you're right. Proverbs chapter 6. And this morning in our passage, we're focusing in on wisdom at work. We're going to read four different um, pieces of wisdom that God offers to us that if we employ them as we are employed in thinking about God's wisdom, it will make a difference in your life and it will make a difference through your life. So my prayer is, as always, that God would give us ears to hear. As we have been saying and seeing that God always encourages us and calls to us and saying, will you listen to me? If you listen, if you treasure, if you absorb these things and put them into practice that your life and your family and the community and then into the world will be impacted. So God, again, in his grace, gives us an invitation to join with him in what he is doing. Now, the good news is that God has provided for us. And you can say amen to that. And the primary way he does that is through giving us work that provides. Amen, pastor. Amen, right? Having satisfying work is a gift of God, okay? God put us in this planet to partner with him in what he's doing, okay? It is a privilege to work alongside God and the opportunities that he gives to us. So again, we're looking at wisdom at work and wisdom that works, okay? So there's four things and these are four sections and we're going to look at each one of them. Now the first piece of wisdom is to do this, to avoid financial traps, okay? There's lots of financial traps out there, and God's wisdom says, avoid these things. So let's again turn to Proverbs chapter 6, starting, of course, with verse 1. So here we go. My son, my daughter, my child, as a father speaking to his children, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. We're going to pause right there. So in this passage, God warns us to avoid two financial traps. Now, the first one is to avoid using your wealth as collateral for a friend's debt. This is like co-signing a loan for a friend. So the question is, well, why is this a trap? Because in so doing, you are risking your wealth on someone else's behavior. And it also changes the nature of the relationship. And it can have a detrimental effect on your finances. Okay, let me give you an example of what I mean here. When I was a young youth pastor, we had a young girl in our youth group, a difficult family situation. She became Pregnant at 16, we walked her through um, with that process, and she uh, adopted this child. She committed her life to the Lord, and she wanted to go to Bible school. Now, going to Bible school is a good thing. I say amen to that. Well, my wife and I decided that she needed, well, she needed some help, and she asked us, would we be available to co-sign the loan for her? Okay, and I was like, well, this is a dire situation. She has no more resources, and she needs some help to go forward. So I did sign my name to the dotted line. Now, was that a good thing? Okay, in one sense, of course it was. Did it uh, put myself and my family's finances at risk? 
Of course it did, okay? And so as we went on, and bless her, she went to one year. She, she never completed that education. She accumulated some debt. Every time that I had to go for a loan, every time that people pulled my credit report, that came up. And there was nothing I could do about it, okay? And so I then started to have to pay, you know, various interest rates and stuff like that. And then our relationship with this young lady got a little, little tense, right? And so now it's like, hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing with the loan? You know, having these conversations. And it changed our nature of that relationship. Now, thankfully, after a period of time, she did pay those things off. But it put my family, okay, my primary responsibility at risk and changed the nature of that relationship. And so the advice from God's word, and if I would have paid attention is, hey, if you've done this for someone that you know, put up security for a neighbor, okay, avoid doing that. Now, secondly, we see that someone is shaking hands, this is what it says, in pledge for a stranger. This is an investment with somebody that you know nothing about, okay? Have any one of you lost money in investment? No show of hands. I'll show my hands. I have, right? I thought it would have been a great idea to give some of my money. We had a house. We sold it. We made some money. Wanted to invest it. I said, hey, I'm going to put it over here, okay? I lost my shirt, okay? And I didn't have a whole lot of money, but I did not investigate. I put money into a a high, higher risk investment because I thought I knew better than the market. I thought I was smarter than everybody else. I thought this was a really good idea. Dave took a nest egg and it became a ping pong ball, right? Not wise. If I would have paid attention to this and had thought through and said, okay, what's happening? Would have built relationship, really looked at, been thoughtful about things instead of having this grandiose idea that I was going to make a whole bunch of money quickly, Okay. Uh, thank you for that laughter, right? Okay. Mistake, right? I made some mistakes financially in the past. And so the advice is to us, make sure that you pay attention to where you are putting your money and how you are covering other people's debts. And this is the advice as he goes on in verse 3. He says, so do this, my son, if you have done this, with somebody or invest in money with a stranger. My daughter, do this to free yourself since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, all right? Putting your income into someone else's hands. Go humble yourself and plead with your neighbor, allowing no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyeballs. Free yourself. Like a gazelle from the hand of a hunter. Like a bird from the snare of a fowler. So what he's saying right here is, hey, if you are in this type of situation, make it an urgent priority to get out of this arrangement. And the first advice is, humble yourself. It's humbling to say, hey, you know what? I can't be in this anymore, right? It's a humbling thing, like I've made a mistake, I don't have the financial wherewithal, I cannot be a part of this agreement any longer. So you have to humble yourself, be persistent in trying to get out of this agreement, and have some urgency before more damage is done. When I made a bad investment, I put in my money, it was going away rapidly. I should have tried to get it out as soon as I could. But I thought, well, that'll be an embarrassment, and you know what, things will turn around. And I just waited, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And we didn't have a whole lot of money, <laughs> right? And I wish I wouldn't have had made that choice for decades. Financial traps, places that we think would be good but end up being poor choices. This is the first advice. And so I have to say, if you're contemplating these things or you're caught in a trap, that there will be a humbling of yourself, there, there would be a, um, a persistence and an urgency to change the situation. 
And by the way, if someone has co-signed something for you and you are the one that's um, owing other people, the advice to you would be pay it off quickly, right? Make it a priority saying, you know what, I'm going to look to free you of this obligation and I'm going to work hard, I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to pay off these debts so not only I can be free, but you would free up the other person. And perhaps you are in that category today and I would urge you to listen to the wisdom of God. So number one, avoid financial traps. Think through things. Read the small print. Don't give away your hard-earned money and put it at risk. Be wise about this. The second thing that we run into in verses 6 through 11 is that we are to work proactively. Not reactively, but proactively. Now, proactively means that these are actions that are proactively uh, initiated, not a reaction to a situation, but instead out of a desire to make a positive change, prepare for a situation, or prevent something from happening. Being a proactive worker is thinking about the future and doing something about it now. Okay? Often we get into work traps and we get into financial traps because all we are thinking about is today, right? Someday you're going to probably want to stop working, right? Or working in different ways. It's called, in this country, retirement, okay? To think about that when you are young. To think about that, you know what, your car will probably break down someday. Hey, you know what, taxes are always coming around the corner, right? To think about these things. And so the advice of God is to work and think proactively. Look down the road. Look to the future. Look that Christmas is coming, by the way, okay? Those presents that you want to purchase, think about these things beforehand. And so he gives us an example, and he says, now look to my creation and look to one of the very smallest insects that God has placed on this planet called an ant. So here it is, verse 6. Now go to the ant, you slugger. Don't you love that word? You slug, you slacker. Now look to the ant. Consider its ways and be wise. Now the ant has no commander, has no overseer, doesn't have a boss, it doesn't have a ruler. Yet the ant stores its provisions in the summer. It gathers its food at harvest time. How long will you lie there? You slacker. How do you like that, right? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a hitting of the snooze button, once again a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief. And scarcity like an armed man. God gives the ant as an exhibit A, as an example of a proactive worker. Now again, the ant has no boss. The ant doesn't come in and, you know, punch in and work and punch out. It has no external motivation besides the internal wisdom knowing that winter will come. God gave even the animals wisdom. And the ants, when you're at a picnic, guess what the ants are doing? They're marching in one by one, right? And they're working when... The going is available. They march out there and they work, 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 work
Because they know that winter is coming. Seasons change, friends. And God's wisdom, it says, hey, not just focus in on what's now, but think for the future. And if you're thinking about the future, that should internally motivate you to work today. But in our lives and in our country, it seems like it's a virtue to do nothing. Amen, Pastor. Well, amen, right? The encouragement of God is get up, get moving. And Proverbs in particular has lots to say about an individual that we can call a slug or we can call a slacker. The only energy that they put forward is to get a more comfortable position on the couch, right? Or to turn over and adjust their pillows. And so I'm going to give us one uh, passage. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 26, and I'm moving really quickly here. Proverbs chapter 26 that talks about the sluggard. And you know people like this, I know people like this, and hopefully you don't identify with this, okay? So in talking about someone who is pretty much just lazy, it says this. The sluggard says, this is their self-justify reasoning. There's a lion on the road. There is a lion on the streets. This means that, oh, if I go out there, there'll be danger, right? I might get sick, or I might get hurt, or I might fall, or I might whatever. And I know people like this, that any excuse to be idle and not do anything will do. And so they make up these um, very minute fears of saying, well, I can't go to work because this, that, and this, that, and this, that, and, you know, it might, might, might go bad for me. So therefore, the wise thing for me is just to stay home and watch TV, right? The sluggard says, and I like this, verse 14, as the door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard in his bed, right? Great imagery, right? There's some movement, but there's no forward motion, Right? All the energy is just to get comfortable once again. <laughs> the sluggard buries or buries his or her hand in the dish. Can you imagine this? It wears them out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard or someone who is lazy, this is what it's describing, doesn't finish what they start. Okay? Dave, you're hitting close to home. Okay? If I go to your house, how many unfinished projects do you have lying around? Matt has some. Thank you, Matt. Testimony time, right? Is it funner to start a project or is it funner to finish a project? I, I should say funner, I should say easier. Easier to start, right? Start something, oh, this is work. I'm going to go start something else. Oh, this is so fun. <gasps> Oh, this is work. Ah, I'm going to start something else. Oh, this is work. This is describing that someone who <laughs> starts something and doesn't finish. I used to work at one time for an auctioneer, okay? And we have people that come to the auction house, and it, it's really fun to buy stuff. And they think, I'm going to buy stuff because later I'm going to sell stuff. Well, I've been into a lot of these folks' homes, their homes now have additions that need additions so they can build another addition because there's so much stuff. And now <laughs> they're paying monthly storage bin fees in the hopes that they're going to sell this stuff sometime in the future as they're buying more and more and more and more and more and more stuff. Okay? You guys know, you guys are looking at me like, I don't know anyone like that. Yes, you do. Right? So the advice is listen. <laughs> Finish what you start. Work proactively. Think about what's happening. And the last verse, verse 16 of this passage, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. They think that they know all of the right answers and all those fools who are working every day, uh, they're way smarter than them as they open up their package of ramen noodles once again. Okay? 
You understanding what I'm saying here? So the Lord tells us with his wisdom that number one, we have to avoid financial traps, but two, be wise and think proactively and give yourself as a worker and God will provide to you and through you by giving you opportunities to exert effort and be wise. Bless God for his awesome provision through abilities to work. And so we are called to work proactively. Third thing that we run into in this um, chapter starts with verse 12. And this is to be a valuable team player. So talking about our finances, talking about our proactive working. Now talking about someone in contrast to someone who he calls worthless versus valuable. And you'll see that this person in the end always stirs up conflict. And then he adds again at the very end saying, this person always stirs up conflict. So the, um, the, the positive way to talk about this is to be a valuable team player. Every company I know is looking for people who are valuable team players. And so this is the advice to us. Verse 12, a worthless person. <laughs> wow, that's strong language. A trouble maker. Someone on the job who is always stirring the pot and creating drama. A drama queen, a drama king, okay? And you know the people, and hopefully this isn't you. This person goes about speaking dishonestly. They'll say something, but it's not quite the truth. There's always spin. There's always this alter motivation that's going on here. Who winks maliciously with the eye. This is a team now. They're people. They'll say one thing. Yeah, we're going to work hard today. Wink, wink, wink. Right? As they go and park in some parking lot for three hours and watch YouTube videos. Someone who signals with their feet. Right? This is what I really mean. Motions with their fingers and plots evil with deceit in his heart. Always stirring up conflict. Don't be like this person. Someone who is worthless to the team, to the workplace, to an organization, to the family, always stirring up conflict, causing problems, continuing on the take all the time. They're not a valuable asset, but they're a draining liability. Don't be that person. Contribute. Give yourself. Look at how you can benefit the team, the company, the organization. This is how God wants us to be. These people spin information, withhold things, create alliances, create problems, and divide and take away. And there's been plenty of organizations, plenty of families, plenty of churches, plenty of places in which they fall apart because people in them are trying to get from them what they can versus give to it what they can. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Okay. God, help us to be valuable team players. And if you choose to be a person who is stirring up conflict all the time, I'm not talking about someone who wants to improve and wants to help a place, okay, and pointing out some things to improve it, but someone who just creates problems because they have ill intent for the organization. This is what happens to this type of person. And God takes this seriously in verse 15. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will be, she will be suddenly destroyed beyond recovery. And we can point to examples of this all around our wor world. 
political examples where people use their position of power and authority to line their own pockets and take advantage of other people. And all of a sudden, with some type of investigation, the truth comes out and they are destroyed. Their reputation is taken down and it says, without recovery. We can see this in the financial world as we see companies and CEOs and COOs and other people are kind of doing things underneath and then all of a sudden it comes out and they are destroyed. This happens, of course, in the church as well. It happens in families as well. Well, as I have had front row seats of families falling apart when they find out that the sister-in-law has been doing this all the years. The brother has been doing that all of the years. And it comes to light and they are destroyed. So the wisdom of God is to keep true, keep honest, be a hard-working person of integrity, looking to be a valuable team player. I hope to God that the church of God would have workers that make a difference positively in the community. And I have had people come to us looking for employers and looking for employees and saying, I want to hire those people because they work hard. Thank the Lord for that. The last thing, and you see a compounding of what's going on here, God points out the things that he hates. And this is pointing towards a person who continues to build up conflict. And we're going to see some important things in this, and I want you to notice that these are things the Lord hates, not people the Lord hates. And by the way, the reason why the Lord hates these things is because it is completely contrary to his character. That's why he hates them. So God gives us a list of, it says, six things, and it almost seems like, well, as an afterthought, well, here's seven. And if you see that in Scripture, there's a few places in which it lists six things, no, seven. All of these six things point to the seventh thing, or the last thing. These are all characteristics of this thing. So let's look to this now. There are six things the Lord hates. That's strong language. He is against these things because it is anti who he is. Seven that are detestable to him, right? He just isn't annoyed by these characteristics. He despises them. It grates him, so to speak. And here's the list, starting in verse 17. Arrogant, haughty eyes. People who think that they're better than everybody else. Have you ever run into anyone like this? They're hard to work with. They think they're above and they're better than all other people. God himself, Jesus Christ, became a servant. Right? Humbled himself. So God hates these arrogant eyes and there's people that are just dripping with this. They're not coming in as a humble servant, but an arrogant overlord. God hates it because it is contrary to his spirit and it doesn't bring unity. It doesn't bring life. It doesn't help the community. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue. You can't trust what they're saying. Why does God hate it? Because God always tells the truth. And if we are people of God and sons and daughters of our Father, then we are to have his characteristics by his Spirit. And God, help us to tell the truth because in lying we create division and division becomes destruction. And destruction creates disillusionment and depression and, and despair. This is why God hates these arrogant eyes. God, help us to be humble. Lying tongue, God, help us to tell the truth. Hands that shed innocent blood. God always protects the innocent 
But often people who are making mistakes try to find someone to pin it on. So they become the scapegoat and they try to spin and to twist it and take advantage of someone else's innocence. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Verse 18, a heart that plots wicked schemes, thinking and uh, conniving and connecting with others to try to get more from the company or get more from the family or get more than what they're due in a wicked way. God's plans are good, not wicked schemes, but good for people. Feet that are quick to rush into evil, God's feet, of course, are quick to do what is good. And you'll see that if you think about how families and organizations and situations, that there are people that always want to take advantage for their own self. Don't be this way. God help us. Verse 19. A false witness who pours out lies. When they're asked about what happened in the circumstance, they're called to give testimony to what took place. They testify falsely. God hates that. So it tells us and points us towards being people of the faithfulness of God, of the following of Jesus Christ, that we're called to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. I'm glad for a judicial system that takes its foundation upon the very word of God, and there's a recognition of that, but God, help us to be truth tellers, even if we're telling something that will harm ourselves, especially then. A false witness who pours out lies, and this is the seventh, this is the culmination of these things, All of these characteristics belong to a person who stirs up conflict among the brothers. In a family, yes. In a church community, yes. In a company or organization, yes. God asks us and calls us to be problem solvers, not problem creators. Amen right there. That's God's wisdom. And if you do this, you will be a valuable team player. And you will honor God at your work. Do not confine the God space to Sunday morning in an hour and a half. This is the fuel and a time which we going, join together to worship God, to hear from Him, to minister, and to listen, God, what are you saying? And we take this and we apply it seven days a week. We don't need churchgoers. The world needs people who follow after Christ every day. This is what we're called to When you go to work tomorrow morning, it's a mission, it's a ministry, it's an opportunity to work hard for the glory of God and shine Him to others. It's just not about punching out another widget or signing another contract or bringing home a bigger paycheck. Look up and understand it's greater than this. You can reflect God in how you work. So apply his wisdom to your work. So let's come into the landing. And we are already over time, okay? I want you to think about this. How does this apply to you? You can find yourself in various um, components of these categories. Perhaps you are a hard worker and I commend you. Thank you. Thank you for working hard. You say, you know what? I'm tired. 
You will be tired. Continue to move forward. Continue to trust God. Continue to say, God, I'm doing this. Will you help me? And you'll see God working, and he will. Some of you may have signed loans for other people, and the wisdom of God says, get out of that if you can. Some of you may be owing money to other people, and it's been highlighted for you this morning. And so I want to encourage you and commend you, be a person of integrity and pay off your debt to your sister, to your brother, to your parents, to whomever. If you owe these things, pay them and say, God, will you help me to do this? Some of us, um, we lose big by a series of small compromises. A little more rest, a little more snooze button, a little another day of vacation. And we lose big by a series of small compromises. Understand these things add up. Listen to the wisdom of God. Look to the ants. Be proactive and ask God for his help and courage and conviction to move ahead. So I'm going to pray for us and we're going to, we're going to end right here, okay? So here we are, God. <clears throat> here we are, here people. God, I'm so grateful for what you're doing in this place. God, I'm so grateful to hear about testimonies of people who have worked hard and own businesses and contributed greatly. God, I'm thankful for those who are even volunteering around here and fixing things and cleaning things and giving and leading and loving. God, I'm excited about what you're doing. And Lord, as we are engaging with you, God, the prayer is always that you give us ears to hear. And God, I ask, Lord, that anything that was said today, spoken today, that is of you will hit our hearts today. Help us to think about this. And help us to absorb these things. Help us to look at our own lives and walk according to your way. So God, I ask that those in this place would feel encouraged and have hope and have your wisdom and work according to these things. Because God, in your grace and your love, you tell us the truth. Even at times it hurts us, but you know that you're doing it because it's best for us and the end result will be the best. So God, I pray for those employers who are looking for good employees, God, that you would provide those people even this week. God, I pray for those, God, who are looking for work, that there would be a good, satisfying connection this week. Or those who are looking for better work or a different opportunity. God, that these doors would open. And God, in all of these things, Father, that we'd be mindful of the greater purpose, of the greater good. we reminded of our sonship, our daughtership, God, being children of the King, that we would reflect you well. And God, we need help, right? We need help. God, will you empower us all, Lord? Will you give us wisdom, God? Will you give us your grace? Father, will you give us insight to understand things? Will you give us your favor, Lord, that we can honor you in this way for your kingdom's sake and your glory in Jesus' name, amen.